In this video, I'm going to cover the strengths of acids and polyprotic acids. So in general, the more polarized a bond is, the more acidic the bond. So um, when we look at the halogen acids, HF, HCl, HBr, and HI, they generally become more um, acidic as we go down the column. So HF is the weakest acid and HI is the strongest acid. So um, the reason that we can see this trend in acidity here uh, has uh, a bit to do um, with electronegativity because as elements become more electronegative those acids become more acidic and it also has to do with uh, the size of the ions. So F uh, is a pretty small atom. Cl is a bit bigger, Br is a bit bigger, and Hr, or excuse me, I is the biggest of all. So um, the two factors that we're looking at here to explain the strength of this series of acids, and we'll talk about this series here in a minute too, um, is the, uh, the size of these ions getting bigger as we go down this row. In terms of increasing electronegativity, F, C, L, B, R, and I, they do have a different um, value for electronegativity, with F being fluorine having an electronegativity of 4 and iodine having an electronegativity of about 2.5. So there is a big difference in the electronegativity values here. But as far as how polarized those bonds are, they're all similarly polarized. Um, be, not necessarily because of those differences in electronegativity, but because as the bonds get bigger and bigger, then uh, the atoms become further and further apart from each other. So the size of a dipole moment, when we're talking about how polar a bond is, there's two factors that we have to consider. We have to consider the difference in electronegativity between two atoms, but we also have to consider the uh, the distance between those atoms. As the distance increases, the polarity, the polarization increases. So HF has a small distance between them because H and F are both small atoms. But HI has a large distance between them because I is a very large atom. So um, when we think about the, uh, the increase in acidity going down this column, it really has to do with the bond, this bond becoming weaker and weaker and weaker. Uh, as we go down, and that's because ge in general, bonds that are made from atoms of the same size, of similarly sized atoms, are generally stronger than bonds that are made of different sized atoms. So H and F are pretty small atoms. H is a small atom and I is a really, really big atom. So that makes this bond between H and I fairly weak. Since the bond between H and I is weak, then that means that this compound is very willing to donate H it donates H very easily because the bond is very weak. H just kind of falls off of this compound when we put it into water. So because it ionizes so easily when it's put into water, we call that a strong acid. It ionizes completely in water. HF, on the other hand, being that these atoms are fairly similar in size, uh, the bond is a lot stronger in HF. So when we put HF into water, not many of the H pluses come off. HF being a weak acid, um, those uh, the bond between H and F is fairly strong, so it doesn't break. So HF, in this, in this uh, series of acids here, HF is a weak acid, but HCl, HBr, and HI are all strong acids. So remember, these are three of our strong acids on our table, or three of our six, and HF is not one of them, even though it's in that, that column. And so now we know why, because the bond between H and F is stronger than the bond between these other elements. So when we look at the chart going this way, H2O is less acidic than HF because F is more electronegative than O. So we look at the bond strength here, A, O and F are similar in size. So there's not much of a size difference here between O and F that contributes to their difference in acidity. So here, it's more about the electronegativity difference. F is more electronegative than O. So being that they're about the same size, this is a, a more polar bond. So this is a stronger acid than H2O. So generally, when we look at the periodic table, when we go from left to right, the strongest acids are on the right. They get stronger and stronger and stronger as we go from left to right. And um, 
acids get stronger and stronger and stronger as we go from top to bottom. So uh, down a column, the, the acid in the top of that column made from the element in the top of the column is the weakest acid, and the one at the bottom of the column is the strongest. And vice versa, or for left and right, the, the acid that's at the rightmost of the row, the furthest right in the row is the strongest acid, and the furthest left in the row is the weakest acid. So here we can see um, a measurement of how strong these bonds are. So the bond energy measured in kilojoules per mole, which is the amount of energy that this compound would have to absorb before the bond breaks, that's 565 kilojoules per mole for HF. Whereas for HBr, it's 364 kilojoules per mole. And you can see how it decreases here. And for HI, it would be even less. So we can see that the the strength of the bond here has something to do with the strength of the acid. A weak bond uh, means that this H is more likely to fall off, and a weak bond is going to lead to a strong acid. Whereas a strong bond with a high bond energy, this bond is very strong, so H is unlikely to fall off. So we would call that a weak acid. So for um, the Oxy acids, so three of our strong acids are HCl, HBr, and HI. And three, the other three strong acids are um, H2SO4, sulfuric, HNO3, nitric, and HClO4, perchloric acid. So those are all oxy acids, which means that they're uh, acids containing some element that's bonded to oxygen as well as, as acidic protons. So uh, Here's a couple of trends that we can look at when we're talking about oxy acids. The more electronegative the Y atom is, so we've got in all oxy acids, we always have an H because that's the acid part, and we always have an O because that's the oxy part. The other element, um, the more electronegative it is, the stronger the oxy acid. So Cl is a, a more electronegative atom than I, so HClO is a stronger acid than HIO even though HI is a stronger acid than HCl. So without these O's on here, the order is reversed. Without these O's on here, we look more at the size of the atoms. I is a bigger atom, so HI is a stronger acid. But when we're talking about oxy acids, now we, we're more focused on the electronegativity. Cl is a more electronegative atom, so HClO, the oxy acid, is more acidic than HIO. Um, and so um, the, one of the reasons that this happens is because the more electronegative this atom is, the more uh, the electrons between that atom, um, between the, that electronegative atom and the H are pulled towards the electronegative atom, which weakens the OH bond even more. So the weaker that OH bond is, where the acidic proton is, the more acidic that acid's going to be. So um, another trend is that the larger the oxidation number of the central atom, the stronger the oxy acid. So if we're looking at uh, acids that have um, the same number of oxygens, three oxygens in each case, and carbon versus boron, uh, boron has an electronegativity of about 2.0, and carbon has an electronegativity of about 2.5, so carbon's a bit more electronegative. But, um, Carbon also, in this case, is going to have uh, a larger oxidation number. And so remember, we looked a bit at, at this in chapter four, but we can find the oxidation number by adding up the oxidation numbers of oxygen and hydrogen. So oxygen's always minus two, so this is minus two, minus four, minus six for these three oxygens. H is always plus one, so that would take our minus six down to minus 5, minus 4, when we factor these in there. So since this is a neutral compound and the charge is 0, then if I have a minus 4 charge, I must also have a plus 4 charge to, to get us to 0. So the um, oxidation number of carbon in this compound is plus 4. But over here, we have negative 2, negative 4, negative 6 are three oxygens. And now I have three positive H's, so that's uh, negative 5, negative 4, negative 3 when I factor these in. 
So therefore, the um, oxidation state of boron is plus three, and the oxidation state of carbon is plus four. So the higher the oxidation state of the central atom, the stronger the oxy acid is. Um, so the more oxygens that are attached to that atom, the stronger the acid. So HClO3 is a stronger acid than HClO2, which is a stronger acid than HClO1. We have more, uh, more oxygen atoms makes that acid more, you, you get even stronger. So here we can have a chart that shows that as the electronegativity of this atom decreases, the acidity also decreases. So HOI, because I has an electronegativity of 2.5, that is the weakest acid because this is the least electronegative atom when we're talking about oxy acids. Um, and since Cl has the highest electronegativity, that makes this the strongest oxy acid. It has the largest Ka. But notice still that these are all very weak acids. Negative 11, negative 9, negative 8, those are very small numbers, very small Ka's, which means that at equilibrium, most of them are going to be undissociated. 99.999999% of, of the compound is going to look like this, and only a very small percentage is going to be ionized to H plus and ClO minus. So here's, uh, we can see the how these compounds are structured. Let's look at um, the one, with the simplest, with just one oxygen. Um, the acidic proton is usually bonded to the uh, the most acidic atom in a compound. Or excuse me, the acidic proton is generally bonded to the most electronegative atom in a compound. So remember, oxygen is the second most electronegative atom on the whole periodic table. F is the most electronegative, and oxygen, O, is the second most electronegative. So we see that the acidic H on most compounds is usually bonded to O. When we see an H that's bonded to other elements, like an H that's bonded to carbon or an H that's bonded to nitrogen, those are generally not acids. They're not acidic H's. So here we can see that the H is bonded to O. It's not bonded to Cl when I have this compound because it has to be the H wants to be bonded to the most electronegative atom. Um, the other w reason that we can see that it's going to fit together this way is because of the valence. Oxygen wants to make two bonds, so it should go in the middle, but chlorine only wants to make one bond because it only has one unpaired electron, so chlorine should go on the end. When, as I add oxygen, so HClO, HClO2, O3, O4, as I add oxygens, I'm always adding them to this chlorine. So here I have one oxygen on chlorine, here I have two oxygens on chlorine, or three oxygens on chlorine, or four oxygens on chlorine. And as I increase the number of oxygens on that atom, the uh, acid becomes stronger and stronger and stronger. Like this first one is 2.9 times 10 to the minus 8, it's Ka. When I add the second oxygen atom, it increases its acid acidity by 10 to the 6th, which is a million times. So this is a million times stronger acid, a million times more acidic than this, just because I added one extra O. And then when I add another O, when I add two extra O's, this increases by a factor of about 10 to the 2, so a factor of about 100. And when I add that fourth oxygen on there, now we just say that this is strong. And remember, s strong acids, the reason we say they're strong is because Ka is so large that we generally can't even measure it. You know, it's 10 to the 10, it's a gigantic number, which means that at equilibrium, there's 99.9999999999% product, and only an incredibly small amount of reactant. That's what it means when I have a huge Ka. It means the opposite of when I have a really small Ka, right? So this thing is gonna be almost all reactants at equilibrium, and this thing is gonna be almost all products at equilibrium, almost 100%. In this video, I'm going to cover polyprotic acids. Because polyprotic acids ionize in steps, each of the H's, each acidic proton, has a separate Ka. 
So for uh, monoprotic acids, we generally see that they have one Ka value. That Ka is referring to the one uh, proton that's acidic. If a compound has two acidic uh, protons like H2SO4, for example, two acidic H's, then it's going to have two Ka values, a Ka that tells us how acidic that first H is and a Ka that tells us how acidic that second H is. And there's always a difference in acidity between if there's two or more H's. They always have a, a different uh, value of acidity. They're never the same. They're never equal in acidity. So um, depending on how many acidic protons there are, we're going to have that many Ka values to tell us how acidic each of those different protons is. So in general, the difference in Ka values is so big that the second ionization does not happen to a large enough extent to affect the pH. And what we mean by that is that um, if there are two H's in an acid, the first H is always the most acidic, and the second H is always less acidic, and the third H is going to be even less acidic than that. They always go in that order. So since the first H is so acidic in a polyprotic acid, the pH is determined almost entirely by that first H. Because let's say that um, we have a, a million of these molecules, and from the first, when the first H comes off, it makes 10,000 H's. When the second H comes off, it's only going to make an additional 100 H's, let's say, because it's so much less acidic. So the difference in acidity between those H's, in, even in a weak acid, is so great that we usually only have to look at the first H. We only have to consider Ka1, the first proton. That's not always true, though. Sometimes we have to look at the first proton and the second, and maybe even sometimes the third. So um, one of those cases is H2SO4, because the first proton uh, is a strong acid, and it, it comes off um, almost 100%. And the second uh, H is also fairly strong. It has a Ka value of 10 to the minus 2. So it's a pretty strong acid too, HSO4 minus is. So we generally um, only have to consider the first H, but in some cases we have to consider both. What we can say is that we can make the assumption that the uh, concentration of the second conjugate base, so the conjugate base of that first um, ionization is generally going to be equal to Ka2 as long as the second ionization is negligible, which means as long as Ka2 is fairly small, if it's a small number, then that means that this assumption holds true, so that we can figure out the concentration of A2 minus um, just by looking at Ka2. And so it, when we think about what we're talking about as far as A minus and A2 minus and looking at these different conjugate bases. It helps to kind of look at um, a series of equilibria like this to show what happens during each dissociation. So remember, we can um, make a, sh a generic acid shorthand with A. A is whatever that other part is, right? So here is our, our polyprotic acid. This one has three acidic protons, H3A. So after the first proton comes off, we make our equilibrium here. Then I get H plus plus H two A minus. Right? H three A. If H plus is gonna come off, then I have H two A minus. And if I add H plus to H two A minus, then I get H three A. So this is what happens after the first dissociation. So I'm gonna write all of these down here in a row. Sometimes it's easier to see what's happening here in a row. H3A dissociates into H plus plus H2A minus minus. And H2A is going to dissociate into H plus plus H1A 
2 minus. So, let's fix this over here. It's supposed to be 1 minus. Still doesn't look quite right. 1 minus. So, this a, whatever a is, um, let's just finish, let me finish this here. H a 2 minus is going to dissociate to become a without any h's, a 3 minus. So here's h 3 a, right? It has 3 h's. Here are my 3 h's. 1, 2, 3. Right, the three H's have come off, all three of them. A minus, here are, here's the three H's, one, two, three, right? Here's the three H's, I guess I, I'd have to count this one, one, two, three, and then the one that's still stuck here on this one. Or here's the three H's again, one, two, three, as individual H's after they've already all come off, right? So a minus, or it's not a minus anymore, now it's a 3 minus. Whatever a is now, it must be 3 minus, because I know that back here when I started, I had h3a, and I know that the h's are all plus 1, so this must be plus 1, plus 2, plus 3. So then a must be minus 3. Plus 3 minus 3 equals 0, so that this compound doesn't have a charge. So a is 3 minus in this case. It has a negative 3 charge. So this is what's happening in a polyprotic acid. H3A dissociates to make one H, but H2A is also an acid. So it dissociates again to make another H, but HA is also an acid. So it dissociates again to make another H. So all three of these H's can come off to make more acid in this solution. When that happens, I have KA1 for this equilibrium. I have KA2 2 for this equilibrium and K A 3 I don't know why I made that one a exponent K A 2 K A 3 is this equilibrium so we have these three equilibria going on because I have three acidic protons so Another thing to look at when we're talking about these polyprotic acids is that this is an acid. It's really only an acid because there's nowhere we'll look at the, the structure of uh, HPO4 here in a minute, or, or really the PO4, the phosphate ion. We'll look at that here in a minute. And we'll see there's really no room for another H. So in order for this compound to be a base, it would have to take H, so then it would become H4A, right? So I know that this is an acid because it can go from H3A to H2A. It can donate an H. We just saw that. That's what I wrote down right here. So this is definitely an acid. And this is also definitely an acid. We just saw why. Because H2A can become H1A, and it can lose this H+. And this thing is also an acid. H1A can become H0A and lose all the H's that it had to begin with. So we can say that this polyprotic acid is an acid three times. Once, twice, three times. So um, what is also interesting about this, let's switch colors here again. I guess I ran out of colors. So I'll just make this one black. This compound is a base. It can't be an acid, so I'll write acid here and then cross it out. It can't be an acid because it doesn't have any H's left. An acid has to have an H. This acid has three H's. This acid has two H's. This acid has one H. This isn't an acid because it doesn't have any H's. This is a base because after something has donated its H away, then it's a base because A3 minus can accept an H, and that's what makes it a base. If A3 minus takes H plus, and it accepts H plus, what does it become? HA2 minus. So this thing is a base. But look at this, HA2 minus can also accept an H, 
And what does HA2 minus become if it accepts an H? H2A minus, right? So this is a base. And this is a base. Right, because H2A minus can accept another H and become H3A. So this guy we just said at the beginning, this guy's not really a base because it can't really go from H3A to H4A because there's no room to hold another H. And we'll, we'll see why in just a minute. So this compound here is an acid and a base. And this compound here is an acid and a base. It can either go forward in this equilibrium to donate an H, or it can go this way in the equilibrium to accept an H. So both of these compounds can do that. So we call these compounds amphoteric. Amphoteric means can act as acid or base. That's kind of like water, right? Water is amphoteric, can act as acid or base. All right, the other thing to notice here when we're talking about polyprotic acids is that um, the first H that comes off is always the most acidic. So Ka1 is always the biggest number. Uh, we haven't talked much about pKa yet. We'll get into pKa in a little bit, but pKa is just the negative log of the Ka. Just like pH is the negative log of the H, the H plus concentration. So these numbers, uh, the smaller the number, the stronger the acid. So we can kind of ignore these for now. Let's just focus on the Ka. First Ka is always the biggest, the strongest acid. The second Ka is always weaker, it's a little bit weaker than this, and the, the third and fourth would be weaker and weaker, so, and so on. So they always get weaker as we lose an H+, to the point that when we get here and we're saying HPO4 2 minus, this compound is an acid, yes, technically this is an acid because it can lose this H and it can do this, right? But look how small this number is, 4.8 times 10 to the minus 13 that's an incredibly small number, which means that although it is technically true that this is an equilibrium and that this compound can lose an H, this number implies that 99.9999999999% of this equilibrium is reactant. And only an incredibly small, almost 0% of it is actually products, which is how we would interpret this very, very small equilibrium constant. So let's take a closer look at um, ionization in sulfuric acid. So uh, again, the first Ka in, a poly, in any polyprotic acid, the first Ka is always the strongest. The first, at, the first proton is always stronger than the second, and which is stronger than the third, and so on. So in the case of sulfuric acid, because H2SO4 happens to be one of our six strong acids, the first H that comes off is strong. So we would say Ka is so large that we can't even measure it very well. So we just say that Ka1 is strong, and this is a strong acid. But after the first H comes off, we're left with HSO4-, minus, which also has another H that it can donate, just like uh, phosphoric acid that had three H's. Sulfuric acid has two H's. So it donates this first H, we get this. But then HSO4- minus can also be an acid. If it donates another H, then we get this, SO42-, minus, sul the sulfate ion. So the first Ka, the first acid, is really strong, um, which means that I have pretty much 100% product. But the next one is not so strong, right? The next, the next proton is a weak, uh, a weak acid. So H2SO4 is a strong acid but HSO4- minus is a weak acid. So we can say that 100 in this equilibrium, I have pretty much 100% product, but in this equilibrium, I have uh, maybe 98% reactant, 
right? And two, only 2% two product in this case. That's about what I could imply from looking at an equilibrium constant that's so small. Remember, when the equilibrium constant is equal to 1, then that means I have 50-50. I have 50% reactant, 50% product. When Ka is smaller than 1, then that means I have more reactant. When Ka is bigger than 1, that means I have more product. So here, uh, here's the structure of a lot of these polyprotic acids. So um, remember, oxygen likes to make two bonds. So we see that anywhere oxygen is bonded to an H, it, it, has a, it also has another single bond to the central atom. So here when we look at sulfuric acid, this oxygen is bonded to H, there's one single bond, and the oxygen is also bonded to S, there's another single bond. So one, two bonds, and same here. One bond to S, one bond to H, two bonds for oxygen. These other oxygen atoms are already double bonded. One, two bonds, one, two bonds. So when I said that there's no room for another H in sulfuric acid, or really in any of these, it's because if I put another H over here, then that would give this oxygen three bonds. And oxygen doesn't, uh, it would make the oxygen unstable to have three bonds. So this uh, sulfuric acid, this sulfate ion, can only hold two H's. The oxalate ion can only hold two H's because it only has two single bonded O's. Here, this has two single bonded O's, so it can hold two H's. Phosphoric acid has three single bonded O's, so it can hold three H's. Citric acid has three single bonded O's, so it can hold three H's. And here we see this is also an OH. And for reasons we're not going to get into in this class, we'll look at this more in organic chemistry. But we call these carboxylic acid groups, so these are actually very acidic here. But this group here is just called an alcohol, so it's not quite as acidic. But you can also see that in all these cases, um, we're looking at all these different acids. The H is always bonded to an oxygen. The H that is an acid is always bonded to an oxygen. In these first few compounds here, there's no other H's. But down here, look, there's H's bonded to C. Those aren't acids. Here's H's bonded to C. Those aren't acids. Here's H's bonded to C. Those aren't acids. And even in some cases, the H's bonded to O aren't acids. So um, when we look at organic molecules, these large molecules down here are organic because they have lots of carbon atoms bonded together. Um, there's, there's other rules that we have to look at. But we can say in general that uh, an acidic proton, an acidic H, has to be bonded to an electronegative atom. And most often that electronegative atom is oxygen.